but we need to be about God's business. The message today is going to be coming out of Luke chapter 5. I'm going to be reading verse 27 through 32. And we're going to expound on it. We're going to have a little fun. And then we're going to do the offer for salvation. And we'll do a closing prayer. Okay? Um, let us open with prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are a rock. You are a firm foundation. You are the the source of everything we build. And we know that you give us gifts, all different types of gifts, dear Heavenly Father, so that you might equip us with the skill sets we need for building your kingdom. You train us in the right works. You prepare us in the right wisdom. And you meet our needs as we commit to seeking after your will and giving you glory. Remind us that you are the lover of our soul. You are the sustainer of our life. You are the tower of our strength. You are the rescuer of our salvation. And that even though the world has so much to offer, they mean nothing because everything we need is found in you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who stepped out of eternity and thought it was nothing to be equal with God. But he lived a perfect life, died a guiltless death, and took on the weight and the sins of all eternity because he loved us that much. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, and we ask that you, you bless this word as it comes forth in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, as I said, my scripture reading today will be from Luke chapter 5, um, verses 27 through 32. But before I get this, I want to read the same event. And that event is called The Calling of Levi. And I want to read that event um, from the book of Matthews. Okay? And that's going to be, I'm actually going to be reading Matthews uh, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And it reads, And Jesus went from there, and he saw a man named Matthews sitting at the toll booth. And he said to him, follow me. And so Matthew got up and followed him. And while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. But when the Pharisees saw, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? Now, when he heard this, when Jesus heard this, he said, is it not those that are well who need a doctor? Or is it a doctor for the sick? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinner. Now the reason I read that passage is because that passage is a little different in this version than it is in the passage that we're going to read, even though I'm going to expound on Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, as we said, this is known as, uh, as the call of Levi. Uh, Levi was a publican or a tax collector. And this calling, and likewise, is told in two other synoptic uh, gospels. It is told in Matthew's chapter 9, which we just read, and it's also told in Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And what I think is really unique about this is that both Luke and Mark identifies the tax collector by the name of Levi. But in the Gospel of Matthews, which was written by Matthews or the, the tax collector himself, he identifies himself as Matthews. So let's get a background um, history on this so, so that when we go through the uh, message, the message becomes um, more understanding. By the time of the calling to ministry, Jesus had already called Simon and Peter, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. Uh, he had already called John and James, who were the sons of Zebedee. And, and so 
He was now about to call his most radical call of all, which was Matthew's. But the call to a life of ministry by a tax collector was probably the most insulting thing possible to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You see, a tax collector during that time was considered an unclean occupation. To the pious, the tax collector was a hands-off type person. You didn't want to touch him. You didn't want to have anything to do with him. The tax collector is used in the Bible uh, whenever uh, the um, the Sadducees in them spoke, the tax collector was often identified with sinners and, and prostitutes. And, and so the view that you would automatically get from Pharisees and Sadducees concerning the tax collector was he was someone they didn't want to have anything to do with. As a matter of fact, if you read the New Testament, the word tax collector or, 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 or um, publican is used 23 times in the New Testament. Nine of those times in the book of Matthews, and of those nine times, multiple times, he's identified as being associated with sinners or prostitutes or an alcoholic. Many, one time in the book of Matthews, a tax, a tax collector is associated with being, um, having an association with uh, Gentiles. So as you see, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees had a very low view of that person who was a tax collector. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector in, in Luke chapter 8, verses um, 9 through 14. And, and, and what he says is in that, in that parable, the, the Pharisee stands up in public prayer at the synagogue and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. All these people who are swindlers and they're crooks and are idolaters and most of all, I'm not like that tax collector. He says, God, I'm right before you because I fast twice a week and I pay a tenth of everything I got. The point I wanted to get across to you is even during that time, Jesus understood that there was a negative view associated with anyone who was a tax collector, especially the religious leaders. But the reason this call to Matthews or Levi, whichever name you want to call him by, the reason this call was so extreme was Levi was a Jewish tax collector. And because Jews thought tax collectors were the arm of the Roman rule, purchases of property and clothing and even food that they had would sell was taxed by the Romans. And in fact, the profits that the Jews would have gotten, they don't get because now they're being taxed on that. And the and the and the tax collector was was enforcing that law. So when Jesus called Matthew, who was a Jewish tax collector, he was calling, he was doing what would have been the most um, egregious of acts. It was the worst act that they could expect a, leave, a rabbi to do. This tax collector had an associates who were not just people of high esteem because no one who was a Pharisee or Sadducees or Sanhedrin had any doings with them. So when, when a Jew decided he was going to commit himself to the profession of, of tax collector, he automatically made himself an outcast. He was like the diseased people whom the law said were unclean. We read later on in, in extra biblical sources that this guy Levi, this Matthews, who was a tax collector before Jesus called him to the ministry, went on to Central Africa in the areas of Ethiopia and, 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 and he preached and converted people into Christianity. Today, Ethiopia has over 56 million professing Christians. And that tax collector 
was the one that brought that about. The purpose of this message today is twofold. The first thing I, I want to do with this message is let you know that God's requirement to, call, to or his call to ministry is nothing like the way people would call you to ministry. There are people who tell you that you need to fulfill this and need to fulfill this to be walking in God's ministry. God doesn't make that requirement to you. And I want you to know how it feels to receive that requirement if you just got to give from here. You have got to tell people about Jesus. If you've got to do the work of the building of the of the kingdom of God, then I need you to know that you have not been called to ministry by a man. You've been called supernaturally by the God, the Jesus Christ, who can make a difference in your life. The second thing I want you to know is I want to motivate you to want to accept God's calling to ministry. And the reason I say this is because I believe with all my heart and with all my soul that there's a lot of you who know inside that God has called you to ministry. You know that, that God has said to you, I can do more for the building of the kingdom of God. And you've been holding back because you felt maybe I'm not smart enough. I don't, I don't know the scriptures well enough. I, I, I may not know how to evangelize as well as other people. I, I, I don't have this or I don't have this. You sound like Moses when God said to him, go set my, free, my people free. Moses says, but I can't talk. God, you know I got a little stuttering problem. He started to make excuses, but but God said to him, says, you will go and set my people free. Jesus saying, follow me to somebody here. And what we have to do is realize that the excuses that we are making, God has already known about them. And, and the excuses that we are making, God has already put in places solutions for our problems. If he's called you, he's going to equip you. And when he equip you, he's going to make sure you got everything you need to build, bring forth his kingdom. Let us break down the passage if we can. Luke chapter 5 verses 27 through uh, 32. Um, and it reads, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he, Jesus, said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and he followed him. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. And a lot of people don't know that the tax collection was a very powerful occupation. You could make some money being a tax collector. And so Levi was rich. And Levi hosted a great banquet at the house, at his house. And it says, and now there was a large crowd of people, some were tax collectors, and there were other people there, and they were reclining at the table with them, with Jesus and his disciples. But the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining to the disciples of Jesus Christ, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus replied to them, is it not those who are healthy, who need a doctor, but instead it's those who are sick? I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. If we can, let's break down this passage for us a little bit. In verse 27 and 28, we read, after this. And I want to stress that word. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. The scripture says, so leaving everything behind, he left his booth, he left his, his, his work, he left his, his, his records keeping, everything behind. He says, whoop, I'm out of here. And he followed him. But the point I want to draw to your attention is the passage says here in, in Luke, it says, after this. And, and to better understand this message, you need to know what this was that it was after. After what did Jesus decide to invite 
this tax collector who would have been otherwise considered a, a horrible, lying cheat to the ministry of God. Before Jesus got to the point of inviting Levi into a life of ministry, the passage starts off, if we go further in Luke, we need to understand what happened to cause the verse to say after this. In Matthew's chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we realize that the first thing that happened was Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath day. And this in itself was something that was forbidden by the law of Moses. In Luke chapter 5, the very same chapter that we're reading from, Jesus is, is in a, a house reclining and, and some men, they break open the ceiling and let down a man who had been paralyzed all his life. And Jesus seeing their face and marveling at the face of these people, he says to the, the man who was paralyzed, your sins have been forgiven. This immediately caused the Pharisees and the Sadducees to say, what makes this man think he can forgive sins? Something that has been regulated to only God. And then the next verse, verse 27 says, and after this, and after healing on a Sabbath day, after forgiving sins and healing a man paralyzed, and after showing them these things, he had the audacity to call a publican, a known sinner, someone that had no friends other than other tax collectors and sinners, in his life, to a life of ministry. And in doing this, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, if you read verse uh, 17 of the of, of chapter 7, it says that there were Pharisees and, and Sadducees from every village in Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And in the presence of all of them, Jesus was making it known that they had put limitations on who God was. They had put limitations on God that God had not accepted himself. First, he healed on the Sabbath day. And when he did this, he's saying, y'all had been putting limitations on what God will do. Second, he forgave sins. And when he was had the audacity to say to the paralyzed mind, your sins are forgiven, he was saying to the Pharisees and Sadducees, y'all have for, put limitations on who God is. And third, he said to the tax, he, he, he had the audacity to select a, a tax collector, a publican, a sinner to a life of ministry. And what he was saying is, y'all have put limitations on who God can use. You see, every one of these religious leaders that were there with Jesus may not have said it with their mouths, but they were testifying with their actions. They were, they were saying with their behaviors that there was no different than the Pharisees in the story of the parable Jesus had said. They thought that because they were going to the temple and they were praying regularly, they thought because maybe because they had given tithes, they, that, that, that they had some special in with God. They thought that because they were fasting on a regular basis, they were better than the tax collector. They were better than the sinner. But what they, Jesus wanted to bring to their attention that when a holy God looks down on a, on a Pharisees and when he looks down on a tax collector, when he looks down on a prostitute, he sees the exact same thing. A sinner in needing grace and a savior. Have you ever met someone that was always putting you down? They, they, no matter what, they never gotten anything good to say to you. You say to them, you know, I think I want to make a change in my life. I'm going to go back to school. And they tell you, you ain't smart enough. You tell them, I'm applying for a new job. And they tell them, you ain't got the talent to it. And if you begin to listen to those type of people that tell you about what you ain't got or how you ain't nothing, you'll start to believe that you're not nothing just like they tell you you're not nothing. But I heard something yesterday when I when I was at when I was at the Kamak when I was at the Come As You Are ministry, I heard something that just it just rang in my head. The next time someone tried to bring you down, the next time someone tells you that you ain't nothing, here's what you tell them. You says, guess what? 
God created the heavens and the earth, the stars, the moon, the sky, and all the universe. He created hills and mountains and valleys. He created forests and trees. He created birds in the sky. And he did this with the, 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 the theological term is ex nihilo, out of nothing. So I'm okay with me being out of nothing because I just can't wait to see what beautiful thing God can create out of me. Don't let nobody tell you that God can't change a situation. Matthews, Levi, was a man who had been known for his, his crooked behavior. But he came to God. He accepted the call of Jesus Christ. And he changed almost all of Central Africa. In verse 29 and 30 we read, then Levi hosted a grand banquet at his house. He was so excited about Jesus calling. He said, man, I'm going to throw a party like ain't nobody seen in a long time. And it says that there was a large crowd of people. Some were tax collectors and there were other people there. And they were reclining at the table with Jesus and his disciples. But the Pharisees and the scribes started complaining to his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? The pastor says that Levi threw a party for Jesus. I want y'all to know this is one of the signs. This is evidence of a repentant heart. You see, before you repent from your sins, you didn't want to associate with those people who would, who would call you out in your sin. But, but Levi had repented. His heart was right before Jesus. And because his heart was right before Jesus, he said, you know what? The next step, the, the Bible tells us, is that there's fellowship with the brethren. And he says, I'm going to throw a party for all my believers. It wasn't but for the disciples, uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and, 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 and Levi. He said, but all my brothers who are, who are, who are following this God, man, Jesus Christ. We're going to throw a party. We're going to invite everybody in the town that want to come because I'm excited about what Jesus, the change he's put in my life. And because I'm excited about the change he's made in my life, I want to tell everybody I know. So come and see this man, Jesus. You see, he could have told him to meet me at the synagogue. But the problem with it is that the tax collectors that weren't welcome at the synagogue. He could have said, come meet me at the Pharisee's house, but they weren't even allowed there. So Levi said, my house is big enough to hold about just about everybody in the town. Everybody to want to come and know about this, this man, God, Jesus Christ. I welcome you to come. We're going to, we're going to eat, drink, and he's going to teach, and we're going to come into a new understanding. Let me tell you something. One of the ways to know you have a repentant heart, one of the ways to know you have received the gift of salvation is that you want to tell somebody else about it. You want, you want to get down. You want to, you want to let your friends know about it. They don't want to hear about it, but you want to tell them about it. You want to, you want to let them know that the changes that Jesus has made in your life. One of the ways that you know that you have received salvation is all you can think about is how do I get to get somebody else to know this? Let me put it another way. He didn't throw a party. Levi evangelized Jesus Christ. So the Pharisee says, and I, and I want to stress this, I'm not even sure if Levi put out, sent any invitations to the Pharisees. He may have sent them to him. I'm not sure. Be, remember, they didn't have any doings with the tax collector, so he may not even known any fa Pharisees by name. But they were there at his party anyway, eating up his food and and, and, and enjoying his company and listening to his music and having a good time. They were there at his party anyway. And while they were there, they decided we, we're going to critique everybody in the party. We're going, to, we're going to talk about everybody in this party. That's what we're going to do right here. And they said to the disciples of Jesus Christ, my son said to me, the reason they spoke to the disciples of Jesus Christ, because they were scared to say anything to Jesus. He said to the disciples of Jesus Christ, why are your master always eating with sinners 
and tax collectors. Verse 31 and 32 said, even though they spoke to the disciples, Jesus answered and said, is it not those who are healthy who need a doctor? No, it's those who are sick. And I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, even though the Pharisees were speaking to the disciples, it wasn't the disciples that responded to, it was Jesus. I think it's important to know that when you have accepted the call to a life of ministry, now I'm not talking about giving up your job to, to, to take on a life of ministry. I'm talking about being a lay minister. That means you're working in your church or, or you're joining us in what we're doing here, but you've decided that I'm going to do more than hear the message every Sunday morning and just sit back. You decided I'm going to do something to build the kingdom of God. When you've committed yourself to do that, I'm going to let you know something you're going to be shocked about. Even people in church are going to be the ones that's going to tell you you're not qualified. They're going to they're going to critique everything you do. They're going to tell you you have to do it just this way by by some theological terminology or some doctrinal standard. They're going to they're going to keep those things and they're going to hold them over you. And I don't want you to get it wrong. I am a, a person who is strict about doctrine. But the doctrine said that you shouldn't work on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, which one of you? If your sheep goes astray or falls in a pit, you won't pull them out on the Sabbath. When that happens, you got one or two things to do. When those people are questioning whether or not you really mean this walk with Jesus Christ, you have one or two things to do. The first thing you can do, you can defend yourself with all your power. The second thing you can do is you can just let them talk and let your seeking after the will of God. You're, you're reaching people for the kingdom of God. You're, you're, you're preaching the gospel to those who have not heard. You're helping the sick. You're helping the downtrodden. Let your work speak for itself. It will be just like Jesus says, I have not come for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for the righteous, but for the sinners. Jesus says, this house is full of sick people. Doesn't it make sense that that's where a doctor should be? <laughs> a lot of Christians say, I don't want to go in those places because those are Christian-like places, but it's where the sick people is that we need to be. Just as this current world is full of unrighteous people, doesn't it make sense that our Savior should be in the midst of them? And I'm here to tell you the only way the Savior will come to the party The only way the Savior will come to this present party, this party of social injustice, this party of country divide, this party of hate crimes, this party of, of perversions, and, 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 and the only way the, the Savior is going to come to this party that we call life today is if you and I become repentant tax collectors and invite him there and throw a party for him. Today, not many people know the story of, of Matthew as a failure and as, a bad, and as an embarrassment. Someone who sold his soul for a job with the Romans. We know Matthew as a follower of Jesus Christ. We know him as the one who wrote the first book of the gospel. And it's important to understand that God's grace doesn't simply invite us to follow him. It teaches us everything we need to fulfill his ministry. Today, I believe Jesus is calling someone right now to follow him. Some to salvation and others to the work of his ministry. Jesus is saying, take off the pain of your past. Take off the suffering that has worn you out. Take out the tired things that have been weighing you down and adorn yourself with grace and forgiveness. And an eternal life that only comes through an intimate relationship with the Savior of the world. If anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ right now, and I'm asking you to come to know him. To make him Lord over your life. 
to make him savior of your soul. And all you have to do, the scripture says, is make him Lord. That means you've decided that it's not your way, but his way. And believe that God raised him from the dead. And you'll be saved. If you want to do this this way at this moment, I want you to raise your hands and say with me, Lord, I'm a sinner. And my sins have called me to separate from you. But if you would forgive me, I will turn from them. And I accept your offer of salvation. That I might be counted among the saints who have eternal inheritance to eternal life, to an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you've done that and you believed it with all your heart, you are now part of the family of God. Let us bow our heads and close in closing prayer. Heavenly Father, as we leave from this service, as we turn off our computers, as we close the doors, or whatever the situation is, we ask that you guide us so that we can reach our, de our destiny. Not the destiny that we've planned, but the destiny that you have planned for us before the foundation of the earth. But we're not just asking for directions on where to go. We're asking for directions on what you would have us do. Help us to submit to your will and your will alone. We ask that you remind us that we should not depend on our own wisdom, our own plans, our own past, but our confidence should be in Jesus Christ alone. Help us to obey everything that your Son, our Lord and Savior, our God, Jesus Christ has taught us. Watch over us and protect us until the day that your son returns or to the day that our eyes close to be with him. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being a part and we look forward to seeing you next week. If you want to be a part of our Bible study, drop your email on this page. Email me and I will add you to our Bible study. We do a Google's Meet Bible study you enjoy it. it. It gets deep into the word without being too uh, uh, spiritual or, or being too uh, theological and philosophical. It kind of gives the word to you, and, and I'm sure you'll be blessed by it. Um, with all this, we say, may the love of God be with you always.